Okay, so my name is Russ Derry. I'm the Director of Education at Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan. And we're very pleased to have with us today Dr. Eamon Haeckel, who's an epileptologist with Spectrum Health. And the topic to, uh, this evening is neurological conditions associated with epilepsy. Um, so welcome, Dr. Haeckel, and thank you for joining us. Um, can you talk a bit about your clinical and research interests and, and also your experience with this topic? Sure. Thank you again, Russ, for having me, and uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. So uh, my name is Eamon Haeckel. I'm a, a neurologist. Uh, I specialize in uh, epilepsy, and I practice at Spectrum Health. I'm one of uh, eight epileptologists currently at the Comprehensive Epilepsy Center at uh, Spectrum Health. Um, I'm interested in treatment, uh, medical and surgical treatment of uh, uh, epilepsy uh, specifically. Okay. And uh, to, to what extent do you see other uh, patients with other neurological conditions? Do you, see, do you focus almost exclusively on epilepsy? Do you see other patients um, who don't have epilepsy or... Not exclusively. I, I, uh, the majority of uh, my patients are epilepsy patients. Uh, I do see uh, patients with um, other neurological conditions, and uh, also we're going to talk about that tonight. A lot of patients with uh, epilepsy have other uh, neurological uh, conditions that are commonly seen with uh, seizures and epilepsy, and um, you know, uh, most epilepsy specialists would also uh, usually take care of these as well. Right. Okay, great. So, um, as you said, uh, many people with epilepsy do also have one or more additional neurological conditions. Um, can you talk a, a little bit about causality, directionality, and association, and how these terms apply to epilepsy and related neurological conditions? Um, so, we, we know that some conditions can actually cause epilepsy, some conditions may be caused by epilepsy, and then uh, some more have a more of a vague association that may not be as clear. So can you kind of talk a little more about that in terms of epilepsy and, and other neurological conditions? Sure. Um, let's talk first about the, the terms. Um, association um, uh, means that uh, two conditions um, uh, tend to occur together at the same time and that uh, their occurrence cannot be attributed to random chance only. Um, you know, for example, um, a lot of patients with, with epilepsy uh, uh, have migraine. We know that migraine is much more likely to happen in a patient with epilepsy than um, uh, in a patient without epilepsy. Um, that is called association. When we say that two conditions are associated, that does not mean that there is a cause and effect uh, relationship between them. Uh, so, so the observation that two conditions happen together that does not always mean that uh, there is a cause and effect uh, relationship. So uh, causation or causality that means that the two condition, uh, conditions have a cause-effect relationship. One condition is causing the other. For example, uh, Cerebral palsy and epilepsy, uh, so uh, you know, an, an, an injury to the brain at birth or, or before birth can lead to seizures. So that's a cause and effect relationship. Uh, stroke and epilepsy, a patient develops a stroke and then later starts having seizures and develops epilepsy. That's a cause and effect relationship. Uh, traumatic brain injury and, and epilepsy, uh, that's again cause and effect. Um, um, you know, sometimes it's uh, 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 we see two conditions that are associated with each other, and the relationship with, between them is, is is vague. I mean, there are theories that um, you know maybe one is causing the other, maybe one is contributing to the other, but uh, that relationship is not very clear. And hopefully, uh, research will clarify that in in the future. Um, Sometimes, uh, you know, we see conditions uh, where we suspect there is a cause and effect relationship and that uh, cause and effect relationship might be a two-way street. So each right. condition is contributing to the other. For example, uh, uh, you know, patients who have dementia and epilepsy, uh, you know, uh, Alzheimer's disease, for example, can be associated with epilepsy. Probably what happens to the brain in Alzheimer's disease is the cause of seizures but then seizures can also cause worsening of the uh, dementia. Uh, so, you know, sometimes that relationship between the two conditions is clear, sometimes it's not. You know, hopefully more research will clarify that. Right. 
Great. Okay, so for the majority of the dis this discussion, we'll talk about um, some different neurological conditions associated with epilepsy, and then for each condition, um, we'll just uh, I'd, I'd like you to describe kind of the suspected mechanisms that can lead to epilepsy in that with that condition, um, the type and severity of seizures that tend to be associated with that condition, um, if there is any special association or any special pattern of seizures, and then um, also how having that condition um, influences your treatment decisions, if at all. And, you know, as we're going along, if you have any examples from clinical practice um, of specific challenges related to um, that, uh, having those two conditions and then how you maybe dealt with that challenge, that would be helpful to, to add as well. So let's start by talking about um, some of the developmental disabilities and, and if you can kind of define that term broadly uh, and then also talk about some specific developmental disabilities like intellectual disability, autism, and cerebral palsy. So uh, uh, developmental uh, disability is, is a broad term that uh, might include um, a, a mental or intellectual uh, uh, disability, uh, so abnormalities in, in brain development that lead to uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, retardation of, of uh, mental or intellectual capacities. Uh, and uh, uh, it also includes uh, motor disability, physical disability. So uh, cerebral palsy is a term used to describe disability that uh, mainly affects muscle strength or control of movement. And uh, it, it's usually, usually due to uh, uh, damage to a, a developing brain, uh, either you know, shortly after birth or uh, you know, even before birth. Um, uh, uh, there is there's a very strong association between uh, epilepsy uh, and, and uh, uh, developmental delay or the, uh, developmental disabilities. Um, so uh, uh, these these epilepsy can be seen in up to one third of patients who have uh, developmental delay. Uh, uh, the, the onset of seizures in, in, in these patients tend, tends to be uh, very early in life, and the, the seizures, unfortunately, a lot of times can be uh, uh, difficult to control with medicine. So uh, uh, patients can experience different types of seizures, and uh, they, they are more likely to be resistant uh, to treatment um, uh, uh, with medications. Um, um, uh, you know, another uh, cause of, of intellectual disability, uh, autism spectrum disorders, uh, these can also be associated with epilepsy, and that can happen in up to 30% of patients with, uh, with, with autism. Uh, I mean, uh, in, in the case of cerebral palsy, probably the mechanism of, of uh, uh, epilepsy is, is damage to uh, uh, nerve cells, to brain cells. Uh, in autism, it's not clearly understood, but possibly there is uh, the, the dysfunction in some brain networks uh, that, uh, uh, you know, control uh, certain aspects of behavior uh, um, in autism um, might also lead to uh, 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 misfiring and, and generation of seizures, but that is poorly understood. Um, uh, I mean, hopefully, you know, this is one, one question that hopefully research will answer in the future. Um, you, you mentioned, you know, discussing what, what challenges uh, we encounter when we're uh, uh, caring for these patients, and one, one major challenge is that sometimes seizures can be subtle, and because the patient has, uh, often has a, 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 a mental disability, uh, um, it, it's really difficult to uh, uh, distinguish between seizures and other symptoms that might mimic seizures, including behavioral episodes or behavioral uh, symptoms. Uh, I mean, a lot of times patients, because of their intellectual disability, cannot tell us what they feel or experience during a seizure. That limits history a lot. And uh, because they might have, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, speech disability at baseline, it might be difficult for caregivers or family members to notice, uh, 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 you know, subtle seizures. Uh, so a lot of times in these cases, what we need to do is, is uh, prolonged video EEG monitoring, try to record the episode and find out if it's a, um, um, a seizure or not. Um, 
Uh, another challenge in, 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 in this patient population is that uh, sometimes it's difficult to, to get di diagnostic testing completed, including EEG and, and um, uh, brain MRI, and sometimes we have to uh, uh, sedate patients or, or even use full anesthesia in order to complete the testing. Okay. Okay. And are, is um, treatment... Uh, treatment decisions affected by any of these conditions? Um, d does that c come into play when you're choosing what medications or treatments to or treatment strategies to to use? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of times, uh, patients with uh, developmental delay uh, might have uh, uh, behavioral issues, uh, behavioral outbursts. And uh, when, when you're choosing a medication to treat seizures, you want to make sure that this is a me not a medicine that is likely to worsen uh, the behavior, uh, behavioral aspect of the condition. So, uh, yes, sometimes uh, you, you, you prefer to use medications that might actually improve behavior that have a mood stabilizing uh, uh, effect. Um, uh, you also want to avoid medications that might worsen, uh, uh, you know, contribute to the uh, uh, cognitive difficulties they experience. So medications that are likely to slow uh, mental processes uh, should be avoided. Right. Okay. Um, and again, we'll, we'll have a, a chance to talk more about um, some behaviors associated with these in, in a little bit, and also when we open it up for questions, people can certainly jump in with any questions they have uh, about specific conditions. Um, so let's move on to some um, acquired uh, conditions that may occur later in life. Um, so let's uh, talk about traumatic brain injury and um, how that tends to interact with someone who has uh, who has epilepsy. Sure. Uh, so uh, traumatic uh, brain injury is, is, is a common cause for uh, for seizures. It's actually the most common cause of uh, symptomatic seizures in, in patients uh, aged 15 to 25. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and and uh, the more severe the injury to the brain is, the more likely uh, 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 epilepsy will develop at some point. Uh, most of the time, seizures start shortly after injury. Some patients can have acute seizures uh, immediately following the injury in the first couple of weeks after the injury, and uh, sometimes seizures start uh, later on. Most of the time, they start within two years of the traumatic brain injury. Uh, but there are cases where uh, uh, patients developed uh, uh, epilepsy years after, after the injury, and especially if it's a moderate or severe uh, traumatic uh, uh, brain injury. Um, uh, you know, uh, patients with, especially patients with severe uh, traumatic brain injury, can also experience uh, neuropsychiatric symptoms um, and can uh, have a lot of uh, uh, cognitive impairment. So that should be taken into account when we're uh, considering medications for for these patients as well. All right. With um, traumatic brain injury, is it more common um, to see? generalized epilepsy as a result or focal epilepsy or or does it really just depend on the injury focal epilepsy usually so the uh, or, or focal onset seizures now seizures can generalize of course right. but the onset is usually focal uh, when, when we're talking about traumatic brain injury and really the severity of the seizure depends on the location which part of the brain was uh, injured most and also the severity of the injury Right. And um, similarly, does I, I imagine the severity of the, of the injury also determines how likely it is that someone uh, with epilepsy related to a traumatic brain injury would be a surgical candidate. Is that, does that really depend on the severity of the injury and how... Uh, that definitely can affect uh, your decision whether to you know the decision on whether the patient is a is a candidate for surgery or not because if you have diffuse injury or widespread injury that um, makes the likelihood of surgical success lower so uh, so if it, you know focal injuries if you can see an injury that is well localized that uh, uh, you know is is considered uh, better in terms of the likelihood of uh, surgery being an option or being successful. Okay. And um, stroke is similar in that it can cause in injury to the brain, but can you talk about how that um, differs from traumatic brain injury in terms of it, the 
the impact it has on future epilepsy? So, so uh, seizures after stroke are also fairly common. This is probably the most common cause of, of epilepsy in, in uh, our uh, elderly population. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and seizures uh, tend to be more common after uh, hemorrhagic stroke. So there are two types of stroke. One that uh, uh, where, where uh, there is death uh, uh, of brain cells after uh, um, uh, interruption of blood flow to the brain, and then there is a hemorrhagic stroke, which is uh, basically bleeding in the brain. And the uh, hemorrhagic stroke is more likely to cause seizures and uh, probably more likely to cause epilepsy. Uh, uh, later on. Again, the, the uh, mechanism here is, is uh, injury to brain cells and, um, uh, you know, injury to, to, uh, um, uh, to brain cells, decreased blood flow or, or uh, bleed in the brain leads to uh, cell death and leads to release of uh, excitatory amino acids. Um, and also, probably during the recovery period, there might be disorganization of, of networks in that injured part of the brain that can lead to epilepsy later on. Right. And um, any, any different impacts on treatment decisions for stroke as opposed to traumatic brain injury? Yeah, I mean, you need to uh, uh, individualize uh, uh, treatment for, for every patient. So, um, you know, for example, there are, again, certain medicines to, to be avoided. If you have a, a patient who had a stroke and um, uh, the stroke affected their ability to talk, if it affected the language center in the brain, right. then you would avoid the medication like topiramate, for example, that is uh, known to cause uh, word-finding difficulties in some patients. Um, so, so you have to individualize treatment and keep in mind that uh, patients with stroke commonly have other symptoms and that side effects of medication can uh, make these worse. Right. Okay. Um, can you talk uh, just briefly about um, epileptogenesis and, and th the idea that, you know, you have an injury and then there's this process whereby the brain kind of learns how to have seizures. And, and whether there's any research being done on that currently and, and how to maybe stop that process uh, from beginning or, or slow that process if you know that someone has a traumatic brain injury or stroke or, or other injury to the brain. Right, so um, there are probably multiple mechanisms uh, involved in uh, epileptogenesis. So epileptogenesis is the process by which uh, brain tissue becomes uh, susceptible uh, to generating seizures, um, and, and that process can be can be really slow. And can uh, this is why you see sometimes seizures happening uh, yeah, years after an injury. Um, and there are probably multiple factors involved there. Again, cell death uh, and, uh, and, and the release of some uh, uh, chemicals that might uh, uh, cause excitation of surviving cells, uh, uh, brain cells, and then disorganized networks in the recovery uh, phase, abnormalities in connectivity uh, among uh, brain cells. And then, um, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, especially in the case of, uh, uh, you know, uh, traumatic brain injury, there might be disruption of a blood-brain barrier and um, uh, there might be an, an inflammatory, an inflammation type of process. Um, and, uh, after some injuries, there's research to indicate that there might be an autoimmune process uh, uh, also. Uh, so... Uh, um, Genetic factors probably contribute uh, as well, right. so it's 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 not one factor that or one mechanism that leads uh, to that uh, epileptogenesis process. It's probably multiple factors that that combine together, and and I don't think we understand those mechanisms uh, fully at this point. And there's uh, we learn something new, uh, you know, uh, every day. Uh, there's a lot of research going on on uh, learning more about these mechanisms. Right. Currently, unfortunately, we don't have any treatment that can alter the uh, epileptogenesis or, you know, say if, if uh, there is a patient who had a traumatic brain injury, there is no treatment uh, that we uh, uh, currently have that can prevent the development of seizures later in life. So we, uh, we don't have ev any evidence. Uh, uh, we probably need better understanding of the mechanisms of uh, epileptogenesis and hopefully we will have such a treatment in the future. Right. 
Okay, so we, we mentioned earlier also uh, Alzheimer's disease, and then there's other forms of dementia as well. Um, and uh, can you talk a little more about um, whether those are more likely a cause of epilepsy or whether epilepsy can increase the likelihood of certain types of dementia? And then again, how you um, uh, how that might appear differently in, in uh, people uh, people with both conditions or, or and then different treatment options uh, for those conditions. Yeah, let's talk about Alzheimer's because it okay. is, you know, uh, the, the most, the, the, the dementia syndrome that is most likely to be associated right. with, with seizures and it's actually one of the leading causes of seizures in the, in the elderly as well. Yeah. Um, so most likely seizures are, are a, a result of the Alzheimer's disease. It's like Alzheimer's disease causes uh, uh, seizures. Uh, I mean, Alzheimer's, there is uh, accumulation of uh, abnormal uh, an abnormal protein in, in brain cells, and uh, there is also uh, neuronal loss, so loss of, of uh, uh, brain cells in the brain that most likely we don't know exactly how you know, contributes to uh, uh, um, seizures in, in some patients in about maybe uh, 20%, 10 to 20% of patients with uh, Alzheimer's disease. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, an, another condition we mentioned earlier that is uh, associated with epilepsy, um, migraine. Do, what do we know about that association? Obviously, not not enough to to say it either is caused by or causes epilepsy. But um, what do, what are some possible uh, reasons for that association? And then again, uh, some ways that having migraine. Uh, alongside epilepsy might influence your treatment decisions? Yeah, so um, uh, good question. This is poorly understood. We know that uh, uh, there's a strong association between epilepsy and, and migraine. So if you have epilepsy, you're at least twice more likely to suffer migraine headaches than the uh, general population. Um, uh, we know that there are certain epilepsy syndromes that have even stronger association with headaches, such as uh, 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 occipital lobe epilepsy seizures uh, originating in the in the occipital lobe in the back part of the brain. Um, uh, it, it, it's it's uh, again the, how why patients with epilepsy have more incidence of of uh, migraine is is really poorly understood. Um, um, it's it's unlikely that migraine uh, uh, you know contributes to the to the epilepsy, but there are some theories on 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 this as well. I mean, uh, migraine um, 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 uh, can cause decreased uh, blood flow to certain parts of the brain. Uh, and there are a lot of theories on how migraine, origin, migraine headaches originate as well. And, and, and there are some theories that maybe migraines also can worsen seizures in patients with epilepsy. But that, that correlation, that association between migraine and epilepsy is really poorly understood. And um, we mentioned uh, Topamax earlier. Is that, is that uh, and why you might avoid that in um, people who have stroke and, lang and resulting language deficits? But with migraine, is that a, a case where you might actually choose Topamax because it can treat both conditions? Absolutely. So uh, actually, when, when you're considering treatment, choosing a medicine for a patient with epilepsy, it's, it's imperative that you uh, consider other medical conditions or other neurological conditions that the patient has. So uh, yeah, there are uh, um, two seizure medications, anti-seizure medications, that uh, are used as first-line treatment for uh, headache prevention, for migraine prevention, and these are uh, valproate and uh, topiramate. Uh, so brand names are Depakote and, and Topomax. Um, uh, other medicines can 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 also be effective. Uh, there's less evidence behind them, but uh, zonisamide or zonagran, uh, gabapentin or neurontin, and uh, pregabalin or or Lyrica can also be used. Uh, uh, to treat headaches, also maybe potentially uh, carbamazepine or uh, oxcarbazepine, uh, but there's less evidence be behind those. So uh, yes, this is uh, this is something that should be considered. Uh, if a patient has migraine, you're more likely to choose a medicine like uh, uh, topiramate or possibly valproate. Right. And uh, one last thing about migraines um, with. Uh, both 
uh, simple partial seizures um, and migraine, you may have uh, symptoms that I, I would assume could potentially be, you know, be confused as to whether it's a migraine or whether it's a simple partial seizure. In, in fact, both both conditions use the term aura. So, um, can you talk a little bit about how you would distinguish between an aura associated with a migraine and uh, a simple partial seizure? Uh, very good question. So uh, uh, that that is something we encounter in clinic, and sometimes it's difficult to make uh, the distinction. Most most auras that happen with migraine are visual auras. Um, you know, so you see zigzag lines or a visual phenomena of some sort, uh, flashing lights. Um, um, so uh, when when patients exper experience uh, visual auras, sometimes it might be difficult. Uh, to uh, distinguish that from seizures arising in the, in the in the occipital lobe, because seizures coming from the back part of the brain, where vision centers are, can also cause uh, visual distortions or visual hallucinations. Mm -hmm. uh, but usually, the the if if you have a typical onset of headache afterwards, uh, then that would point more towards uh, uh, this being a, a migraine. Right. Uh, so uh, um, uh, history is very important. So in clinic, the physician has to uh, um, know the details, um, uh, the headache characteristics, what it feels like. Uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, if it's associated with other symptoms such as light sensitivity, nausea, uh, noise sensitivity, these are symptoms that are commonly found in, in patients with migraine. Um, you know, some. Patients uh, with migraine, as they grow older, they stop having the headache component and they continue to have the visual aura. And you know, we we uh, these patients are often referred to the epilepsy clinic um, um, because they're having visual auras only without any other symptoms, uh, without the headache, and that raises concern for uh, 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 occipital lobe epilepsy. Right. But usually, again, if, you, if, if the patient had experience, has experienced the, the same aura at a younger age with a headache, then it's more likely to be a migraine aura. So these patients usually do have history of migraine at a younger age, uh, so aura plus the headache, and then when they grow older, they lose the, they don't have the headache component anymore. Um, sometimes it gets complicated when patients experience um, other auras with migraines. So, for example, sensory auras, tingling or, or numbness, uh, uh, or when patients have uh, rare types of migraine like uh, uh, basilar migraine or when they have uh, 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 confusional migraines. And certain, and very rarely, migraine can be associated with uh, you know, speech difficulty, word finding difficulty, uh, or you know, mild confusion. Even this is quite rare. But when this happens, it's really difficult to distinguish uh, uh, from uh, a, a seizure. And uh, again, video EEG monitoring usually uh, is the most helpful tool. Uh, you try to record the episode, and that should tell you whether it's a seizure or not. Right. Okay. Um. So multiple sclerosis is another condition that um, seems to have an association, although from what I've seen, it doesn't seem to be quite as strong an, as an association as with migraine or some other conditions. But can you talk about um, what's known about that? Um, you are right. It's not as there's not a very strong association. This is at least not as strong as the uh, conditions we uh, uh, spoke about. Uh, but uh, there's some research showing that patients with multiple sclerosis are more likely to develop epilepsy compared to the general population, or actually three times more likely to have seizures at some point during the course of their uh, multiple sclerosis. Um, again, the reason here is, is, is not clear, but uh, one theory is that uh, the plaques of inflammation that uh, uh, cause multiple sclerosis can uh, sometimes involve the superficial layer of the, of the brain called the cortex, which is uh, 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 where most seizures happen, and that these plaques can cause damage to nerve cells and subsequently seizures. Um, I mean, there, there are some theories that maybe seizures in patients with multiple sclerosis can actually uh, uh, um, encourage or promote the inflammation process as well, but um, uh, these are theories that are not, you know, uh, proven yet. Okay. Um, so, uh, and last, lastly, I wanted to talk a little bit about some um, 
uh, conditions that might traditionally be thought of under the realm of psychiatry, but but could also you know easily be considered neurological conditions because they are brain conditions. So um, wanted to talk about you know mood and anxiety disorders, and then also schizophrenia, and um, uh, the again the association between with those and epilepsy, and then how that impacts treatment. Um, so mood mood disorders are, are very frequently seen in patients with epilepsy. Uh, at, at least half of patients with epilepsy suffer from uh, um, uh, either depression or anxiety or or both. Um, uh, I mean, there's also some research that uh, indicates patients with seizures are more likely to suffer bipolar disorder and and psychotic uh, uh, symptoms uh, as well. Um, again, there are multiple factors that uh, might lead to uh, uh, depression or anxiety in a patient with epilepsy. Uh, um, I mean, these include the uh, abnormalities in, in networks, uh, uh, in brain networks, uh, or certain uh, uh, brain structures. Um, um, for example, anxiety has been associated with uh, abnormalities in the amygdala. Uh, uh, this is a structure in the uh, deep part of the temporal lobe. Uh, um, uh, commonly uh, uh, site of origin for seizures. So uh, the majority of focal epilepsies actually start in the temporal lobe. Um, uh, uh, other contributing factors, I mean, uh, side effects of medicine sometimes can uh, contribute to uh, depression or anxiety. Uh, and then uh, how seizures affect affects, uh, 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 patients' uh, uh, Life and ability to do things that can also uh, result in, in uh, depression and anxiety. Patients who do not have a lot of uh, support, uh, uh, social support, and uh, who, who are under a lot of stress uh, um, are also more likely to develop depression and, and anxiety. Um, you, you mentioned schizophrenia, and I mean, there, there is there is some research that suggested that uh, there is some association between the, the um, epilepsy and schizophrenia. However, that that link is really weak, uh, is is really poorly understood. Uh, we know that epilepsy is commonly associated with psychotic uh, uh, symptoms of psychosis, uh, so hallucinations or uh, delusions. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure about uh, uh, schizophrenia. If that link is is really well established. Okay. And um, again, in terms of looking back to mood and anxiety disorders, um, uh, your treatment decisions, um, how often do you, you know, use anti-seizure medications that also happen to be mood stabilizers, uh, you know, for cases of, um, I mean, does, does, do mood stabilizers work for depression or is that only really for bipolar disorder? Uh, uh, there are uh, uh, seizure medications that can stabilize mood, that can elevate mood, and uh, um, it can help with depression and with uh, bipolar disorder. An example is uh, lamotrigine or lamicto, and also uh, 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 valproate or depakote, uh, um, uh, oxcarbazepine or trilepto, uh, and um, you know, also carbamazepine or, or tegretol. So, uh, yeah, that is definitely a factor in choosing the right medicine uh, 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 for a patient with epilepsy. So if they have uh, uh, depression already, you might avoid medications that uh, could worsen that, including uh, levetiracetam or uh, Capra. Uh, so sometimes there are medicines that make depression or anxiety worse uh, and might cause irritability or behavioral changes, and there are medications that can actually help the mood problem and stabilize mood. Okay, great. So um, w were there any other um, neurological conditions that um, we haven't mentioned that you wanted to discuss, or have we pretty much covered the most common ones that tend to have an association with epilepsy? Um, we, we didn't talk about uh, sleep disorders. Uh, you know, epilepsy right. can, can affect... Uh, quality of sleep, and uh, uh, a lot of patients with epilepsy have uh, sleep disorders. Some sleep disorders, especially insomnia and uh, obstructive sleep apnea, can actually worsen seizures, can provoke seizures uh, during sleep. Um, uh, 
uh, I have also seen some some cases where uh, uh, seizures were misdiagnosed as uh, sleep disorders and and vice versa. Um, so. Uh, you know, uh, this is sometimes uh, often neglected when uh, when the patient is evaluated in clinic. But we should uh, also ask about sleep disturbances uh, when, and you know, as part of uh, treating patients with epilepsy. Right. Okay. So uh, we talked a little bit about this before, but I want to delve into a little more deeply. Um, so many of these conditions that we've discussed can include symptoms, behaviors, or episodes that can be hard to distinguish from seizures. Um, can you give some examples of those um, that where where it might be difficult to distinguish between a symptom of another neurological condition or uh, whether it's a seizure? Absolutely. So uh, a lot of times it's really difficult to differentiate between seizures and episodes that that mimic seizures based on on uh, history alone. Uh, uh, this is when diagnostic tools, specifically prolonged video EEG monitoring, is, is uh, uh, can be very helpful. Um, so, but but still, history is is the most important piece of of the puzzle. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, the more I tell patients, the more detail you have, uh, the more helpful it is. Um, because sometimes uh, very small details can can help you make the distinction between seizures and and seizure mimics. Um, so uh, you know, uh, uh, one example is, you know, is it might be difficult to distinguish between partial seizures and and TIAs or mini strokes. Uh, so mini strokes happen when there is uh, lack of uh, blood supply to one part of the brain for a short period of time, not long enough to cause a permanent damage. So patients experience uh, a neurological symptom uh, for uh, a short period of time, usually usually hours. Um, and sometimes it's difficult to make the distinction between this and a, and a partial seizure, especially when the TIA causes a uh, uh, disturbance of speech uh, because the, the patient might look confused, they might not be able to express themselves, and this can be mistaken for a, uh, a partial seizure. Again, uh, details in, in history are helpful. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, seizures uh, tend to be uh, shorter in duration and are more often associated with confusion, unresponsiveness, or losing memory of, of the event, not remembering the event altogether. Uh, um, other symptoms can also be helpful. For example, if you see lip smacking, that's uh, more likely to be a seizure. Uh, um, but still, in some cases, it's really difficult, and this is when, when you need to uh, rely more on, on diagnostic tests, uh, uh, especially video EEG. Right. Um, and, and patients with, with developmental delay, uh, um, we, we spoke uh, a little bit about that, but uh, you know, sometimes patients with developmental delay can have uh, movement disorders or stereotypes such as uh, uh, hand flapping uh, episodes. Um, uh, again, details are helpful, so knowing what triggers the episode and how long it lasts and uh, whether it can resolve with the distraction of the patient can, can differentiate between a seizure and, and a behavioral episode. Uh, but a lot of times, history is not enough, and what we have to do is admit the patient to the epilepsy monitoring unit to record these episodes uh, to be able to tell for sure. Right. So mo one of the key determining factors it's uh, it seems in, in most cases is um, you know the length of the episode and uh, or most seizures tend to be you know a few seconds to, to up to three minutes um, and maybe some postictal confusion but um, in the case of non convulsive status epilepticus um, that seems like that would be very difficult to distinguish between dementia or, or other neurological conditions that can cause prolonged confuse, confusional states. Can you talk a little bit about non-convulsive status epilepticus and and the challenges associated with that? So non-convulsive status epilepticus can can present only with confusion. The patient might be confused, and uh, you know diagnosis might be really difficult without doing uh, uh, EEG. So you should be able to see it on EEG, and this is how it's, it's usually diagnosed. We just we have to keep in mind that uh, you know patients sometimes present with memory issues and conf you know uh, uh, family members notice forgetfulness and, and confusion and decreased uh, cognitive uh, uh, abilities. Um, that does not always mean dementia. Sometimes uh, patients uh, who are having seizures 
uh, on and off are misdiagnosed as having dementia. So uh, EEG should be part of evaluating uh, a patient with uh, confusion or with altered mental status. Um, you know, luckily, uh, non-convulsive status epilepticus happening, uh, you know, as a first seizure is uh, that's unlikely to occur. But we see those cases sometimes, uh, usually in the hospital, um, and you know, initially the diagnosis can be missed because the patient uh, might still be able to respond to questions, but they might sound confused, and the practitioner might not consider um, um, seizures in the in the in the at, at the top of the list of differential diagnoses. Right. Okay, uh, so both epilepsy and most of the associated conditions we've discussed can cause problems with cognitive function. So for, for many people, the other condition may have come first before the epilepsy, and they may consider this other condition to be their primary disability. And as a result, they may tend to attribute any cognitive difficulties to this other condition and not realize the role that epilepsy and its treatment can play in cognitive function. Can you talk about um, some of the modifiable effects of epilepsy and its treatment on cognitive function and why it's important to address them rather than just kind of dismissing them as an inevitable consequence of these other conditions? Sure, and, and, and you're right. Unfortunately, we see that sometimes that uh, the negative impact of, of epilepsy or uncontrolled seizures on, on cognitive function is, is overlooked. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, it's assumed to be part of the uh, dementia. Mm -hmm. uh, so we know it, it's a fact that seizures, uh, especially seizures that are frequent uh, and seizures that are prolonged, that last a long time, can interfere with cognitive functions. And that can affect memory, language, processing speed, uh, reasoning, uh, so different uh, domains of, of cognitive function. Uh, uncontrolled epilepsy can have uh, an impact also on the development of, of uh, a young brain. Uh, and it can slow down recovery from uh, traumatic brain injury or, or from stroke. Uh, uh, also side effects of medicine sometimes can have an impact on cognitive function. So uh, uh, we mentioned the example of uh, topiramate causing word-finding difficulty in a, in a, in a worsening word finding difficulties in a patient with uh, a stroke or a traumatic brain injury. So uh, we have, we, we definitely, in any patient with uh, cognitive impairment where there is worsening, we should also always suspect that one possible cause for the worsening is uh, subtle seizures or uh, uh, seizures that go unnoticed or subclinical seizures. Uh, so EEG should be a part of uh, investigating any worsening uh, of, of cognitive function that is uh, unexplained. Um, so, and, and you know, we also have to keep in mind that you know some medications might worsen things, and we have to remember that the goal of any treatment should be not only controlling seizures but also having a patient on medications that don't cause side effects and don't affect the quality of life negatively. Right. And and for for people who have um, uh, multiple neurological conditions, do you do you tend to recommend periodic vi video EEG monitoring or um, just to help distinguish between the different conditions, or or is that something you kind of just do as needed if if there's a a symptom they're experiencing and you're not sure what, which it is. Uh, Russ, can you repeat the question again? So uh, you mentioned yep. periodic video EEG monitoring. Yeah, it's, it, it, I, I guess patient. with people who have more than one neurological condition, the, the epilepsy and another neurological condition, do you typically do like per, uh, video EEG monitoring periodically, like more than you would in someone who just has epilepsy, or do you only do it kind of as needed? If, if there is some symptom that you're having trouble distinguishing between the two conditions? I, I would say as needed. So indications for video EG monitoring, uh, you know, the, the most common indication is usually uh, uh, diagnostic, finding out if the uh, a certain episode that the patient is having is epileptic or not. If it's a, uh, and then if it's epileptic, uh, what type of epileptic seizure is is Is, is it a generalized uh, abscess seizure or is it a complex partial seizure? And um, but another another goal for for uh, of, of video EEG monitoring is to quantify seizures and to find out if the patient is having subtle seizures. Right. 
Um, so, you know, again, uh, uh, sometimes we use it in a patient with uh, um, cognitive impairment uh, 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 because, for example, of dementia or uh, a traumatic brain injury where there is worsening of their cognitive abilities, and we cannot explain that. So you want to make sure that they're not having seizures. So that's another indication sometimes for video EG monitoring. But it is as needed. You wouldn't do it periodically. Right. Okay. Um, under what circumstances does it make sense for someone with epilepsy and another significant neurological condition to see separate neurology specialists, like an epileptologist or, or maybe a stroke specialist, or you know, uh, two neurologists as as opposed to just one who can manage both conditions. That's a good question. Uh, it, it really depends on the complexity of the case. So uh, most most epileptologists are experienced in treating common neurological conditions. So if a patient has um, a depression, for example, epileptologists most likely will try um, antidepressants first. But if there is no uh, good response to you know first line treatment, uh, then the neurologist might uh, the epileptologist might refer the patient to a psychiatrist at this point. Right. And uh, the same thing applies to you know uh, to other problems as well. So sometimes uh, if if uh, there's uh, the, 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 the desired response to treatment is not obtained, then the the neurologist might uh, choose to refer the patient to a neuropsychologist, to uh, you know, we mentioned the psychiatrist, to a stroke specialist, uh, to uh, um, a neuroimmunology or a multiple sclerosis specialist. So it really depends on the complexity of the case, but uh, uh, most of the time the epileptologist will. Uh, uh, try to treat uh, straightforward common conditions uh, that are seen with epilepsy without referring to somebody else. Right. Okay. So what are some tips to help patients with complex medical needs um, coordinate their care and ensure that all the members of their healthcare team are communicating well with each other? Because in some cases they may also be seeing other specialists, you know, speech therapists or... Um, Occupational or physical therapists, you know, they have cerebral palsy, for example, or um, some of the other specialists you just mentioned. So, how 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 do you co coordinate that care so you really maximize communication between that whole healthcare team? Um, well, the main problem, uh, uh, even in the era of uh, electronic medical records, is, is having access to medical records. So I, I encourage patients to um, um, keep a list of uh, who they're seeing, um, you know, with contact information, and to try to keep copies of their uh, medical records. So. Uh, um, uh, a lot of times the this, this specialists they're seeing might not be in the same institution, so the physicians will not have direct access to each other's notes or documentation. Uh, so it's very important to keep records and uh, help physicians get access to, to records. Uh, um, also, when, when multiple specialists are involved, it's important to keep an up-to-date uh, list of medications because you know the medications might be changed, and this is not communicated. Uh, you know, due to uh, physicians not being not using the same electronic uh, medical record system. So uh, it's important for patients to keep uh, a, a written list of of uh, their medications and and doses um, 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 as well. Okay. Um, can you talk about some emerging areas of brain research that have the potential to positively impact our understanding and treatment of multiple neurological conditions, including epilepsy? Um, well, a lot. Uh, we, we talked about uh, multiple factors being involved um, in, in that process uh, called epileptogenesis. Uh, uh, that uh, predisposes uh, uh, parts of the brain to uh, uh, um, generating seizures. Um, uh, I mean, there's not one mechanism that can explain it, and, and uh, uh, we need research on multiple fronts. Um, you, know, you know, most likely, and that includes uh, genetics. Um, you know, research on on. Uh, um, potential um, neuroinflammation or uh, uh, autoimmune processes. Uh, uh, um, you know, research in, in genetics is, is especially exciting. Every day we discover that genetic factors uh, play a role in, in that uh, disease mechanism. Uh, 
uh, um, and, and uh, uh, or that correlation between two conditions. Right. Uh, so um, that is really exciting. There is an area of genetics called epigenetics as well. Uh, uh, this is study of uh, how our uh, uh, how expression of of genetic data is is altered without changing the core structure of our. DNA. So uh, environmental factors might contribute to turning certain genes on and off, and that uh, you know might explain a lot in terms of uh, disease mechanisms, uh, including in epilepsy. Right. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, I think we're going to go ahead and open it up to questions. We might have a slightly shorter call than we typically have, but that's all right. Um, so let me go ahead and unmute. All the lines, and then, um, and before I do that too, if, if I can encourage people, if there is background noise, um, to go ahead and mute your mute your lines if you're not planning on asking a question. And to do that, you can use the mute feature on your phone or dial star six to mute. And then, if you want to ask a question and you're muted, just dial star six again, and that will unmute your line. So I'll go ahead and unmute all the lines, and then we'll get started with questions. All guests have been unmuted. You will now rejoin the meeting. Okay, who'd like to get us started with a question? Okay, I will. I'm Marissa, and um, I would like to find out what is your opinion in regards to um, uh, now. As you've met, you've mentioned quite a few of the medications that I have taken: Topamax, Depakote, Lyrica. Tegretol and Kepra. I want to find out what is your opinion about Dilantin? Um, uh, Dilantin or phenytoin is a uh, it's a good medicine in terms of controlling seizures. The problem with Dilantin is uh, um, the, its side effect profile uh, and uh, its uh, potential potential interactions with other medicines. So. Uh, Dilantin has been around for uh, such a long time, since the uh, 1950s, probably. Uh, uh, so it, it's in, in terms of controlling seizures, it's probably as good as any other medicines, uh, any other medicine uh, uh, out there, especially if we're talking about partial seizures. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, a lot of the older seizure medications uh, tend to, are, are more likely to cause side effects, uh, and some of the side effects you can. Uh, get with dilantin include uh, 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 enlargement of the gums, which can result in dental problems. Uh, um, uh, um, with time, uh, uh, some patients might develop uh, uh, vitamin D deficiency. Uh, um, uh, very rarely, dilantin can be associated with a, a neuropathy, which is damage to uh, uh, nerve endings, usually starting in, in the feet. Uh, and you know, uh, rarely dilantin can have uh, um, uh, negative effects on 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 the liver as well and on on blood count. So, uh, because of uh, dilantin having a higher likelihood of causing side effects, then it's it's um, not used as often as uh, say you know 20 or 30 years ago. But you know, sometimes patients fail to respond to multiple medicines, and they respond well to dilantin. So I do have patients in my clinic who take dilantin, and a lot of them um, actually are, are fine without side effects. But uh, it it might not be a first line treatment because of its side effect profile. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, I'm 72 years old and. I'm trying to avoid dementia, and I, all these doctors are telling me and writing books about living a healthy lifestyle can avoid dementia. So are there any tips you could tell me? I mean, I eat healthy and exercise and positive thinking, you know, and all that. Everything I've been told, I, I do. I think you're doing the right thing. So uh, keep your mind active, keep your brain active, um, and uh, stay healthy. So eat healthy. Uh, you know, avoid. You know, we, uh, 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 there is some association between uh, you know common problems like diabetes, high cholesterol, high yeah, blood so pressure, and, and dementia. So well, I'm type one diabetes, but it's very right. well controlled. 
That's excellent. And, you know, uh, what you have to do is, again, uh, you know, uh, keep your brain active, exercise, eat healthy, and Uh then uh, keep diabetes under control. So one thing that was particular with um, epilepsy that you could tell me I need to do. Uh, Do you have epilepsy as well? Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, getting uh, what... uh, uh, when it comes to epilepsy, the best thing to do is to keep seizures under control as well. So, because seizures can, you know, cause uh, uh, memory problems and, and oh, yeah. can also affect other cognitive abilities. So, you oh, know, yeah. uh, as long as seizures are under control, I think I think the risk of uh, developing uh, uh, cognitive issues or dementia will be low. Okay. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Okay. Other questions. My name is Matthew Miller. On a normal epilepsy person, how many medications are they on? So how how, how many medications, or I guess what's the average number of medications that someone with epilepsy is on, and maybe what's the range of medications? Like how, how many medications is... is too many? Is there ever a number of medications that that you know, doesn't make sense to be uh, having that many anti-seizure medications? Well, yeah, because I'm on two, three, one, two, three, four, four right now. Okay. And some of I think I should be taken off of. Uh, one or two, because, but I'm afraid I should and shouldn't because I'm still having seizures. But I just was normal. If I'm a normal person, that if that's normal or okay. okay so the the majority of patients with epilepsy uh, take just one medication. So uh, you know. Uh, when, when a patient with epilepsy is started on medicine, there's a 60% chance that this will control seizures completely, that they will remain seizure-free on that medicine. Uh, some patients, if, if one medicine does not control seizures, then another medicine uh, uh, should be added. So that uh, brings the number up to 65% uh, maybe, and then uh, in some cases you have to add a third medicine. Now, after you, you try two medicines, if uh, seizures are still happening on two medicines, then the chance of completely eliminating seizures become, becomes low. Uh, you know, but we do sometimes try to add a third medicine and rarely a fourth medicine. Uh, you know, neurologists have different practices, so uh, uh, I try not to combine that many medicines. I mean, rarely we have to, and if the epilepsy is severe and the patient is having very frequent seizures and they fail multiple medicines, and uh, we have proof that, uh, that you know, a certain combination of medicines is working for that patient. But, uh, um, you know, a lot, of when, when a lot of neurologists, when they start a new medicine, they try to uh, taper off uh, an older medicine. Uh, so uh, to answer your question, it's not common uh, for patients. It's not very common for patients to take uh, uh, four medicines at a time, but sometimes we have to do that to get the epilepsy under control. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? I have a question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I have a question. Yep. Sure. Oh, hi. Hi, my name is Kim, and um, I have non-epileptic seizures. I don't know if you are familiar with that. Absolutely. Okay, they're called non-epileptic. And mine are very frequent, and they're not controlled, and my speech gets slurred sometimes, and I actually get paralyzed sometimes. And I just wondered, can that affect my cognitive functioning because they're not epileptic? And then what, what, um, I heard you say something about one medication can usually keep the epileptic ones from happening, but in my, my case, I mean, nothing's helping right now. Right, so non-epileptic seizures have a very different mechanism. In in non-epileptic seizures, uh, um, what happens is is stress basically at some point causes the brain to shut down. That can cause different symptoms. The symptoms can look very similar to epileptic seizures. 
But because the mechanism is very different and the treatment is very different as well. So usually anti-seizure medicines don't do much because anti-seizure medicines prevent electric, abnormal electric discharges in the brain, and this is not what happens in non-epileptic seizures. Uh, the, the one treatment that is proven to be effective in non-epileptic seizures is uh, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, this is a type of uh, 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 psychological therapy, and a lot of patients can improve with that, and, and seizures uh, uh, can stop as well. Um, having, if you have non-epileptic seizures, you're more likely to also experience uh, mood disorders such as depression or anxiety. So this can indirectly uh, affect concentration or memory. So a lot of patients who have depression or anxiety and who have non-epileptic seizures can have uh, 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 cognitive complaints like uh, memory loss, decreased concentration, uh, but usually this, this is not uh, a permanent issue. So with treatment of depression and anxiety, these symptoms are reversible. So okay. uh, non-epileptic seizures should not cause brain permanent brain damage uh, to where you you have an issue with uh, with memory. If, if depression, anxiety, and, and non-epileptic seizures are under control, uh, uh, you should not have any cognitive issues. Okay. Okay. Great. Other questions? Yeah, right. oh, go ahead, uh, Greg. I heard Greg, and then some, someone else can go next. I got a question for you. So what... Uh, what uh, uh, what does bipolar mean? Uh, bipolar is a, is a mood disorder where patients um, fluctuate between uh, uh, depression and the, the opposite of that, uh, which is uh, mania. So, um, um, and, and they can have episodes of depression uh, alternating with episodes of, of uh, mania. So it's a mood disorder usually treated by uh, a psychiatrist. And... Um, um, uh, you know, we mentioned it uh, in, in this program because uh, 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 there's some association between this and, and epilepsy, and, and some seizure medicines are actually used to treat bipolar disorder. Okay, thanks. Okay, and someone else Thank has you. a question at the same time? Yeah, I had a question. Thank you very much for the information. It's really helpful. Um, I wonder if you could comment on epilepsy associated with brain tumors, especially benign brain tumors and focal epilepsy. My understanding is that sometimes those types of seizures can be very difficult to treat, and I just wondered if that's been your experience and if you've had any success or if you have any comments on, um, like, refractory epilepsy due to benign brain tumors. Mm -hmm. With, uh, in, in general, if epilepsy is due to a benign brain tumor, in general, that should not be very difficult to treat. Uh, um, um, uh, Drug-resistant epilepsy is more common with tumors that are uh, infiltrative, that infiltrate uh, 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 brain tissue and are not well localized. Uh, mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, yeah, we see that rarely, that uh, benign tumors are associated with epilepsy, usually focal epilepsy, as you mentioned, in most cases, uh, they're not highly resistant to treatment. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, other questions? Yeah. <clears throat> Hi there, this is uh, Grant. And um, I don't know if you can hear me all right. Yep. Yeah, we can okay. hear you well. Go ahead. All right, sweet. Um, <clears throat> Well, I've got a whole array of questions, but um, the one that I was really interested in was um, insomnia and um, the effects. Of, is it from uh, just epilepsy or the medicine that I take? Cause I also take Zylantin. Um, just can you speak on that for just a little bit? It, it could be both. Uh, um, you know, certain medications might uh, uh, be associated with with insomnia. Uh, one example: I mean, a minority of patients who take lamotrigine might experience that. Uh, but I would say it's probably more likely to related to the epilepsy itself, and sometimes to mood disorders associated with epilepsy. So we know that depression can cause insomnia as well. Um, I mean, a lot of patients with depression can have difficulty sleeping, or patients with anxiety. Uh, as well, and there's probably an association uh, with with epilepsy that is not well understood. Uh, 
um, and then having frequent seizures, of course, can, can disrupt uh, sleep patterns and, and, and can result in insomnia as well. So I would say it's less likely to be the medicine. Uh, you know, dilantin is not known to cause that, but sometimes patients, patients experience atypical side effects. So if you feel that the insomnia started after you started taking uh, dilantin, uh, it, you should discuss this with your uh, neurologist. But there are probably multiple factors in patients with epilepsy that contribute to that. Okay. And, and, and Interesting. Just as a follow up to that is um, if you're experiencing insomnia and you've and you've kind of tried the behavioral approaches, meaning you know good sleep habits, having a regular sleep schedule, and not watching TV right before bed, not looking at, at a bright screen before bed, you know. Um, not drinking caffeine before bed, all of those sort of things that are that uh, can also contribute to insomnia. If you've tried all of that and you're still having insomnia and you don't suspect that it's your anti-seizure medication, are there other medications that can be used to, to treat insomnia that that you know wouldn't interfere with anti-seizure medications or exacerbate seizures or you know, that type of thing? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, I mean, uh, medications, uh, sometimes in patients with epilepsy, actually, especially patients who have uh, uh, drug-resistant seizures, we use benzodiazepines like uh, clonazepam or, or clonopin. Um, um, uh, I advise patients to avoid some of the over-the-counter sleep aids because they all of them contain uh, Benadryl, which uh, in, in some cases can provoke seizures. Um, 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 I advise patients uh, to try melatonin. Uh, that is overall considered safe in, in patients with uh, seizures and then can, can help uh, 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 regulate sleep and uh, can help treat insomnia as well. Um, you know, sometimes we, we use uh, antidepressants, especially when uh, insomnia is uh, somehow correlated uh, to, to depression. Um, uh, certain antidepressants can uh, help uh, with insomnia, for example, trazodone. Great. Yeah, because I, I do um, take the melatonin, and I also take um, like a tablespoon of uh, cherry juice concentrate at night, and um, that seems to help a little bit as well. Yeah. So, all right. Well, cool. Thank you. Okay. Sure. You're welcome. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Okay. Last chance. <laughs> Other questions or, or any comments? Anyone want to share any any uh, any particularly anyone who has multiple neurological conditions? Um, has anyone uh, had any? Strategies or treatments that have been particularly effective um, that you know you think others could could benefit from from learning about. All right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, one comment I have is is uh, you know make sure you discuss with your doctors. Uh, you know, other conditions that uh, often coexist with epilepsy. So, you know, insomnia, depression, mood issues, uh, uh, cognitive issues, memory problems. So uh, don't neglect these problems. Don't just focus on controlling seizures. Uh, and there are studies that uh, show that controlling depression uh, um, um, can have a great impact on improving uh, uh, quality of life. I mean, uh, controlling depression is probably as important as controlling seizures in patients with epilepsy. So, talk to your doctor about these issues. Don't just focus on uh, seizure treatment. Right. Right. Okay. Well, well, the comment I have was yeah, go ahead. It's Clinton. Yep. The comment I have, Adivan, that's right there because I have my seizures aren't controllable. You know, I'm trying to see. I think from Adivan, it calms them down. Yep. So that, that's you said you're on Adivan and that, that controls yes. the seizures? Okay. Yes. Yeah, that's in addition to other medications as well? Yes. I see. Adivan is often used as a rescue medicine, so it's valuable for patients who have breakthrough seizures to prevent recurrence of seizures. Uh, so it's, it's, it's an effective rescue medicine. Okay. Great. 
All right. Well, I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up if no one else has any more questions. And um, again, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Haeckel, for, for coming in at the last minute and giving a really outstanding presentation on this, on this complex topic. Thank, thank you, Russ. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, thank you so much.